Hello, my name is Marcy Diane. I'm a registered physical therapist. I'm one of the physiotherapists with the physiotherapy program at the Prostate Cancer Supportive Care Program. We're a provincial program and provide services to people with a diagnosis um, of prostate cancer and their significant others and supports. And we're available throughout the province. Um, before I start the presentation today, um, I just would like to give thanks to our funders for the program. This is an awesome program. Um, the quality of the services, the type of services we are able to give is in many ways unique and absolutely, fa absolutely fantastic. And so I'd just like to have people have a moment to view this slide. Without this funding, this program wouldn't be available. Um, this is an education session. I would like people to ask their questions as they arise. Um, there, if there are any medical concerns, I will be able to pretty much identify that and ask you to bring that up to your physician. Anything that I say can be shouted from the rooftops, but if people share with the, in the um, session today, I'd ask that we keep that confidential within the people attending the session. I don't know where you are um, on your journey with your diagnosis and your treatment. Um, if you need to get up, move around, uh, take care of yourself, leave the room, come back, don't come back. Um, please do whatever you need to do to help yourself to be comfortable, and I won't take any of that personally. So a little bit about the Prostate Cancer Supportive Care Program. We don't actually provide treatment for prostate cancer, um, but we do provide supportive care around the diagnosis and the effects of the different treatments that people undergo. We also do some really um, valuable, lovely, important research. Um, the program is a set of modules uh, that provide care. Um, and each person can identify which programs or modules are relevant to them and request to be um, enrolled in that program, in that component. Currently, there are seven modules. I um, work in the pelvic floor physiotherapy for bladder and bowel concerns, and that's what we'll be talking about in today's session. So some of the objectives or the objectives for today's session are right here. I really believe that if something's not working in the body, it's really important for a starting point to understand, well, how is it supposed to work? So how is our bladder control? How is our bowel control? How is it meant to function? What happens when we have treatment for prostate cancer, either um, radiation, external beam or brachytherapy? How does that affect our bowel and bladder function? Um, same thing with prostatectomy. If we have our prostate removed, how does that affect bladder control? We're going to be talking about pelvic floor contractions. People often refer to them as Kegel contractions. I'll be referring to them as pelvic floor contractions. So those are some of the things that, um, how the body works, the treatment that's had, how does that affect um, bladder and bowel dysfunction or changes? What can we do about it? Within this program, myself and your healthcare team are going to do every possible thing we can to get you as continent, as continent as can be. But also until that happens, and for some people that might not happen, how can we support people to live fully in their lives, do everything that they want to do with full enjoyment and full confidence in their bowel or bladder management strategy? So we'll be discussing that briefly as well. There is also a role for the pelvic floor and management within sexual activity, and we'll be discussing that. There is also a sexual health module within this program, and I highly recommend that if anyone is having any kind of sexual dysfunction or questions or concerns that they actually um, contact the front desk and um, ask to enroll in the sexual health module. So before we start, I'd like to talk a little bit about how does your bladder work? Um, what are the typical control mechanisms? So this here is the bladder, and this is the urethra. That's the tube that the urine runs out of the body. Now, the bladder, we have two types of muscles in our body. We have automatic muscles and voluntary intentional ones. So the heart, the intestine, the bladder, those are automatic muscles. Can't really control it. There's a center in our brain that actually controls whether that bladder is tightening or relaxing. So when the bladder is storing urine, this bladder is relaxed and it's storing urine. As more and more urine comes in, that bladder starts to stretch. And there's little stretch receptors in the wall of the bladder. 
And as it stretches, um, those stretch receptors receive that information. They give a message to the brain. They say, hey, brain, I'd like to pee. And then the brain says back, remember, this is how it's supposed to, to work. The brain says back, oh, bladder, I just took you half an hour ago. You're not full. Bladder, you be quiet. Muscles, you tighten up. You go on about your business. You forget you have to pee. That messaging might happen two or three times. If it happens, it's not panicky, not urgent. It's just, yeah, bladder, be quiet. I'm not taking you now. You're coughing, jumping, sneezing, going from sit to stand, walking, blowing your nose, no urine is leaking, everything's working the way it should. Um, maybe after a while that bladder is quite full and it stretches again and it says, hey brain, I'd like to pee. And this time the brain says, well bladder, yes, you are full, it's been a while, I'll take you to the toilet, but I can't right now because I'm in the middle of doing a lecture. Or I'm on a walk and there's no toilet here and there's no tree I can duck behind. Or, okay, bladder, I'll take you, but the bathroom's busy and there's only one toilet. You're just going to have to wait a minute. In that moment, the need to pee is not urgent, anxiety-provoking. It's just something you need to take care of. You finish your talk. You finish your walk. Bathroom empties. You get up. You calmly walk to the toilet. You open the door. You close the door. You walk in. You get to the urinal or the toilet. You get your clothes ready. And then the brain says, okay, bladder, now you can go. Muscles relax. Now, bladder, you can contract. When it contracts, it moves the urine out. As soon as the urine is out, bladder relaxes and muscles tighten up again. And then you're back into storage. Now, things change if people have radiation. Radiation can either be an external beam coming from outside the body or radioactive seeds that are implanted right in the prostate and that's called brachytherapy. So radiation irritates the lining of the bladder and the urethra. Um, and it can cause some burning when people void or when they urinate. It can also cause frequency, so the person has to go more often than they would with smaller volumes, and it can create a sense of urgency. So not a sensation of, oh yeah, I've got an urge, I need to pee, but an, oh my gosh, I really need to go to the toilet, I really, really, really need to go now. It's very, very panicky, very urgent. There can also be incontinence associated with urgency that usually resolves four to eight weeks after treatment. If someone is having urinary urgency, there are different things that can be done to help them. There are medications that people can take that calm down the bladder tantrum. Um, there are certain dietary things and that I think is on the next slide. So they, some of these th foods irritate the bladder and make it um, contract sooner and more intensely. And so we recommend that you eliminate these foods and then add them back slowly one by one and see if they're increasing your symptoms. Um, if people increase their fluid intake, sometimes uh, people have a, um, if the urine is more dilute, it can be less irritating to the bladder. Often when I suggest this, this to people, they say, Marcy, what do you not understand? I'm going frequently and it's really urgent and it's uncomfortable. So I'm actually decreasing what I drink. And I'm gonna say, no, I've heard that. But actually if the, if the urine is more dilute, it, it might be less irritating and it, it can be quite helpful for your symptoms. There are some urge management techniques that we teach people. I'm going to go over this a few slides later. I'm not going to discuss it at this moment. Um, all of this stuff, if you come in for treatment, we review it and go over it with each person one-on-one -on -one in more detail specific to that person's um, specific situation and needs. If there is some incontinence or urine leakage, um, again, that usually resolves four to eight weeks after um, radiation is completed. Those are the dietary irritants. Now, some people after radiation two to five years later, they then develop incontinence. What can happen is that the radiation is in the tissues and radiation has a half-life. So it starts here and then it decreases and then it decreases and it decreases and it decreases, but the radiation persists in the tissue and over time it can change the tissue and it might affect some of the muscle or nerve fiber um, that manages or that helps you stay dry or continent. Um, if you find down the road you're developing new onset of incontinence, see your physician, um, see your physiotherapist. Um, that might be a time when it would be helpful for you to start having some physiotherapy for bladder concerns. At any time, whether you've had radiation or your prostate removed, if you're having difficulty voiding, you're having difficulty going pee with a moderately full or full bladder, you do want to contact your physician. If you're finding that you need to push in order to initiate going pee, or you have to push through the whole stream of urine, 
when the bladder is full or moderately full, you probably want to make an appointment with your physician as well, or if you're unable to avoid. Um, sometimes what can happen is that you get a, a bit of a, a stricture, there's some scar tissue and it forms a stricture, a bit of an obstruction to the urine flowing, um, and that needs to be assessed. And if it is significantly stopping urine from coming out, as you would tell from these symptoms here, then I, usually you have a procedure done that opens up that stricture so the urine can pass freely. So that's urinary effects of urgency. I wanna talk a little bit about bowel effects um, so urinary effects with radiation. I want to talk a little bit about bowel effects with radiation. So, you know, this is our GI dude, you just swallow food, it goes into your stomach. And when it's in the stomach, um, a lot of uh, fluid and acid gets in, in, entered in there and it's a liquidy acidic mass or mass and it, it goes through the small intestine. So the small intestine is really, really long but it's called small because it's narrow. As it goes through the intestine, there's actually a layer of muscle. And the muscle, again, it's one of those automatic muscles, is just doing this. And as it's having this rhythmic contraction, it's moving the contents through the small intestine. That rhythmic ongoing contraction is called peristalsis. As the contents are moved through the small intestine, the things that your body needs to be healthy and strong are taken out, the nutrients. And then once it's through the small intestine, it enters the large intestine. Now, the large intestine is much shorter than the small, is, is much shorter than the small intestine. It's called large because it's, it's wider. As the contents go through with that muscular rhythmic peristaltic, peristalsis movement, the um, contents are quite liquid when they enter. And as the contents go through the intestine, the liquid is resorbed into the body and the solid that's remaining is formed into stool. And that's how you make poop. So when the, the stool lands right here, um, there's a little message and it goes back up to the brain. It says, hey, there's either some liquid solid or um, formed stool to take to eliminate. And then the brain makes a decision to tighten the muscles and keep it in or to relax the muscles and let it out, depending on where the person is at. What happens with radiation is this area, whether it's brachytherapy or external beam, this is the area for prostate cancer that's receiving the radiation. So before you have external beam radiation, people are often asked to fill up their bladder significantly. When that bladder gets full, it takes up more space. And you see the intestine living right here. So when the bladder is full, it pushes the intestine up out of the way. So when the radiation is targeted to these tissues, the intestine is moved out of the way and it doesn't get the radiation in the same way. However, you can't move the bladder out of the way and you can't move the rectum out of the way. So often people, when they have local brachytherapy or they have external beam, the local tissue, the bladder and the rectum behind gets some radiation and gets irritated um, in the same way that the bladder gets irritated. And what happens with the bowel is that a person can have a loose or a watery stool, abdominal cramping, they can have some bowel or fecal urgency. And it's almost like a diarrhea that happens. If this is happening, if you're taking any laxatives, we really recommend that you stop taking them, that you start on a low fiber diet, and you avoid these um, bowel irritants that are listed right here. We do recommend that you keep your fluid intake up. I'm going to talk about the urge management techniques are very similar, bowel and bladder. And we also recommend that you see a dietitian within the Prostate Cancer Supportive Care Program. We also often um, uh, dietitian services, um, nutritionist dietitian services. And so again, you would phone the front desk. Um, the contact information is at the end of this session and you can make an appointment. Remember, all of these um, services are available throughout the province. Um, and they're both in-person and available um, virtually um, online with Zoom. So again, um, any bowel urgency or incontinence related to radiation, really, really recommend that you also contact not only the physiotherapy module, but the dietitian in the program as well. Um, some of the things for managing bowel in, is decreasing the fiber. There's this booklet that's available from BC Cancer. Um, and this is the link to it here, and you're, um, that's available for you to read.
I'm going to, going to just discuss really briefly the urge management techniques. So whether you're having an intense, oh my gosh, I need to get to the toilet to pee, or oh, I really, 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 really urgently need to have a bowel movement, there are some urge management techniques that we encourage people to try and do. So the most important thing at the beginning is just stop. You have that urge, bowel or bladder, don't make a mad dash, immediately run to the toilet. Just stop where you are and try to keep yourself calm silent nose breathing, talking to yourself, distracting, and tell your bladder or your bowel, I will take you, but not in this moment, not with this behavior. When you calm down, yes, then I'll take you. And we also recommend that you tighten your pelvic floor or use that kegel contraction. If you're able to use that muscle, it'll stop urine or stool from coming out. Once the intensity of the urge calms down, you're calm for about five or so seconds, then proceed calmly to the toilet. On the way to the toilet, that urge comes back, stop. You're back at the beginning. Calm yourself, your bowel, your bladder, tighten your muscle, wait till it calms, proceed. You're at the toilet or the urinal getting your clothes ready and the urgency comes back, stop. Calm yourself, calm your bowel, bladder, use your muscle once it's calm then proceed to get your, your clothes ready. And so again, we work with people one-on-one -on -one with the different components of this, helping, um, helping people acquire skill with these techniques. Sometimes with loose stools, people are having difficulty. Um, they have a burning or an irritation in the skin. One of the things that we recommend is getting a zinc oxide barrier cream. Camelceptine is, a, is one that people find really, really helpful. Um, it's similar to Penitent or the other. It's a, basically a barrier cream or a diaper rash cream. Um, when it's on clean skin, it helps the skin heal. And if it's on when stool passes, if the stool doesn't get onto the skin or especially onto the irritated skin and it can be white, um, quite helpful and prevent um, discomfort as well as the healing. If you are using a zinc barrier cream, make sure you wash the area at least once a day gently with warm soap and water and you apply the cream, um, dry the tissue, dry the skin and apply the cream again. We recommend, you know, if this is the anal sphincter, that you, it's not applied outside, it's not applied inside, but you wanna really apply it liberally into those puckered areas. Because often people get little fissures or cracks, right? Uh, cuts right in the cracks. And so you really want that cream protecting the area. So um, any questions on bowel uh, or bladder urgency before we move on to prostatectomy? and stress urinary incontinence. Okay, so I'm going to be moving on now and to talk about what happens when the prostate's removed. So when I told the story about how your bladder works, I didn't give full information. So if you look at the bladder right here, when the bladder's relaxed, it's storing urine. But if you notice at the base of the bladder, there's an opening, and a tube, your urethra, coming out for the urine to drain. So if your bladder is relaxed and storing urine, how come it's not going out this opening and out the urethra? So what happens, remember I said that that bladder is an automatic muscle. So what happens when that bladder is relaxed, this part of the bladder here and slightly into the urethra, those bladder muscle fibers, also the internal sphincter, are tight. So when this is automatically relaxed storing, this is automatically tight and keeping urine in the bladder. When your bladder is full and your brain wants it to empty, there's a bladder control center, a micturitional control center in the brain, and then it tells this area to relax. Once that area is relaxed and the opening is, is available at the bottom of the bladder, then it, the, the control center tells the bladder to contract. When the bladder is contracting, it squeezes the urine out and your bladder drains. As soon as the bladder is empty, that bladder control center tells the bladder to relax. Once it's relaxed, it tells this automatic closure area to tighten up and you go back into storage. Now, this is the prostate right here at the bottom of the bladder. So you notice the prostate lives right up into the bottom of that bladder wall. It doesn't go into the opening or the, the 
hollow area of the bladder, but it lives embedded within the bladder wall at the bottom there. So when the prostate is removed, they want to remove every single prostate cell. And so when they remove the prostate, they also remove some of that automatic bladder closure mechanism. And some of that automatic bladder, the closure mechanism lives into the, the urethra and this part of the urethra is removed with the whole prostate. So you still might have some automatic closure, but it's not functioning the same. And now people find that they leak when they go from sit to stand or when they cough or when they sneeze. So what happens anytime you use your arms, your legs, your head, you cough, you sneeze, you exert yourself, you lift, you push, you pull, you generate pressure inside your abdominal cavity. And that pressure is going to go to the path of least resistance. It doesn't go out your bones. It doesn't go up heart and lung. It goes to the softest thing in that container, which is your bladder. And it gets squeezed. And now you don't have that automatic closure mechanism working the same. So before your surgery, it was working fine. You would cough or sneeze or stand up, the bladder would be squeezed, but that automatic closure was working really well. Now it's been changed, it's not working as well. If the pressure, so there's your bladder, there's the urethra. If the pressure squeezing the bladder is greater than closure pressure, you leak. So it's called stress urinary incontinence. It might be emotionally stressful, and it is for many people, but the word stress is not in this situation referring to emotional stress, it's referring to physical stress, squeezing the bladder, and it's greater than closure pressure, and the person leaks. So in our body, so we talked about the automatic closure mechanism at the base of the bladder, but we also have another mechanism for closing the bladder and that's our pelvic floor. And that's why people are encouraged to do Kegel or pelvic floor contractions. So I'm just gonna show a model. This is a pelvis. So this fits in my body down here. This is your pubic bone right here. So that's the bone that's very low at the front. These are often called like the hip bones when you have your hand at the side of your body, you feel that shelf and at the back, there's the sacrum and then the tailbone very low down. So if you look at the bottom of this model, this is a pelvis, the bottom of the pelvis has a floor. And when we talk about the pelvic floor, that's what we're talking about. There's an inside layer and an outside layer. I'm sorry, unfortunately, this is a female model. It's exactly the same in the male and the female, except these the pieces that go from the back here up to the front in the male, instead of going from the back to the front, they go from the back and they wrap around the penis, okay? So otherwise it's identical. When you're contracting this muscle, you can't contract the inside separate from the outside. You can't really separate the front from the back or the back from the front. And you can't contract one muscle and not the other. It's a package. It has, actually the muscle has many different functions. At this part of the lecture, we're going to be talking about its continence, bladder control. Also, can't, it's a bowel control muscle. Um, later in the lecture, we're gonna be talking a little bit about its sexual function. But right now we're talking about its role in continence. So if you're able to contract this muscle group, it'll actually help you not leak urine. I'm going to be talking about doing some pelvic floor exercises and some contractions right now. If you're listening to this or at any time in the future, if you actually have a catheter in place, do not do these exercises. The urologists recommend um, waiting until the catheter is removed before you do any pelvic floor contractions or kibble contractions or exercises. So we're gonna help you understand the hockey analogy in a minute. But right now, what I'd like everybody to do is we've, I've shown you the anatomy. We've talked about some of the function of this muscle. I'd like everybody just to sit comfortably where you are. I'm going to ask you to tighten. I'll have you hold it for about five seconds or so, but I'm going to ask you to relax. And then I'm going to ask you some questions about that experience. And we're going to find out maybe why people had different experiences. So everyone relax. Okay, now tighten whatever you think your pelvic floor is. Tighten it and keep it tight. Keep it tight, tighten it, tighten it, let it go. Okay, how many people when they let it go felt that their glutes relaxed, their buttock muscles? How many people felt that they left their, let their breath relax? 
How many people felt that they let their upper abdominals release? How many people felt that they let their inner thighs release? Okay, so if you thought yes to any of those, none of them are your pelvic floor. So we know for women, we don't have as much research for men, but we know that correct technique is very difficult to get based on verbal and written instruction, which is basically what's happening in this lecture. There's a lot of confusion and we understand why there's confusion. When I ask my pelvic floor to tighten, there's some changes in the diaphragm and my lower abdominals tighten. Now, often people are more aware of those muscles or of their lower abdominals specifically, and they might start with their pelvic floor and then they feel their lower abdominals, they're more comfortable or more aware of that, and they go on to maintain a, a lower abdominal contraction and the pelvic floor dissipates. So if we're doing pelvic floor exercises, we want the pelvic floor to be the player with the puck, not to pass the hockey puck. And sometimes that player passes it to another team member and the other team member gets it in control. Sometimes the player with the puck passes it to the opposing team and people tighten their gluteal muscles, their you know, buttock cheeks or their inner thigh muscles or their upper abdominals or they hold their breath. So these are some cues that people, if you're on your own playing with this, and again, we're never going to know unless you come in on a one-on-one -on -one appointment, what cue actually works best for you. It varies between people. Some people, when they tighten their anal sphincter, they get the best control of the unit. So one of the things you can pay attention to if you tighten at your anus, does it also make sense that that would bring in muscles that you would ask to tighten if you didn't want to leak urine or if you wanted to stop your flow of urine? The other thing that we that often people find helpful, actually the cue that works best, but I find clinically for most men, is that if this is the testicles here, and there's the anus, to think about the area just behind the penis or behind the testicles or between the anus and the testicles, that's called the perineum. So often if people think of that area um, and tighten from there. And again, when you're tightening, think, well, did, would this stop urine? Would it stop bowel? Sometimes people use the cue to stop going pee. We tend not to like that cue when your bladder is emptying, we want you to empty. So if you're using this cue, don't use it when you're actually going pee. When you're not actually emptying your bladder, then think of, okay, I'm gonna use the muscles I would use to stop my stream of urine or to stop a leak. Sometimes that cue works. Sometimes people think of lifting their testicles and that can be helpful. It's really interesting because the muscle around the testicles isn't even part of your abdominal floor. It's a slip of abdominal muscles that goes through the, the groin around the testicles and lifts it. But in the end, it doesn't really matter the cue as long as the cue works for you. And that's what happens when you come in one-on-one -on -one, is we try to figure out what's the best way for you to figure out how to use this in your body. Some people think tightening their penis towards their body or tightening their penis and their anus together. So there's tons, lots and lots and lots of cues. Um, and again, we work with people um, to figure out the best ones. We're just providing these here, if you're listening, that you can start to play around with it. Things that you can do at home is you can, sitting without your clothes and you can tighten and watch your penis. If you're getting the contraction, the penis moves a little bit towards the body. Um, but I know some people that have been Olympic in their skill and strength and they tighten their pelvic floor really well and their penis doesn't even really move. So that might work for you. One of the things that you can do, and again, if an anal cue is going to work for you, is you can, if you're standing, you can put your hands behind your buttock and actually just put your hands close to your sphincter and pull your cheeks apart. The goal isn't to just stretch your buttocks and pull your cheeks apart. The goal is to pull your cheeks so you feel a little bit of stretch at the anus and then be aware of where that stretch is and try to do the tightening and the letting go from that point. Some people find that helpful. The other thing you can do is put a glove on or a finger cut lubricate, and you can put your finger just at the opening or slightly inside the sphincter. Once you put your finger in though, it will trigger reflex contraction. So don't move your finger, don't move your body, just relax for about 10 or 15 seconds, and then see if you can use your sphincter to pinch your anus. That pinch is a pelvic floor contraction, is part of the pelvic floor. The other thing you can do is you can put your, if you're sitting, it's easier to reach, 
put your fingers underneath behind your testicles. Remember that muscle that goes along here and up around the penis? You can't separate the pieces of the pelvic floor. So it's part of the pelvic floor. You put your fingers here and when you tighten, you might feel a rope pop out. So that might also be a way of confirming that, yes, that helps me to focus on that or to feel that. That helps me get my um, pelvic floor engaged and tighten it. You, your lower abdominals, when you tighten, so the abdominals down here will automatically come along. You don't want to lead this contraction with your abdominals. There's very clear evidence that if you lead with your lower abdominals or your abdominals, you're not going to benefit for a, a urological or a bowel um, concern. You want to make sure that you're not leading with your buttock muscles. So sometimes that gets confusing for people. And you want to make sure that your breathing is normal. You don't want to use your breath to find your pelvic floor. Um, and there's, you, people will run into difficulties with that very quickly in their pelvic floor rehab. Your pelvic floor is a tool that you need to use independent of anything that your body is doing so that you can then use that tool, that pelvic floor to stop leakage with any activity and in any position that you'll be in. And for example, say if you're carrying something and you need to carry it for three or four or five minutes and you want to stop leakage, you need to be able to tighten and carry for three, four or five minutes. And if you're holding your breath in order to get your pelvic floor, your breathing will win over your muscle, you know, airways, breathing, circulation, you'll start to breathe. And if you're using that strategy to find your pelvic floor, you'll actually probably lose your contraction. So there's very much a skill required in learning how to use your muscle. And there's skill in, first of all, we like to teach people how to contract and relax the muscle. Once they can do that, then we want people to learn how to maintain the contraction. So often people say, Marcy, Marcy, well, how many should I do and how long should I hold it for? And that's very hard for me to say because I don't know what your skill is. So if you wanna play Mozart on the piano, you have to learn where middle C is. And then you have to learn C major scale. Then you have to learn how to play Twinkle Twinkle Little Star and progress your skill until you can do what you want it to do. Skill is being able to do this in standing, lifting against gravity. And we like to say an intensive uh, pelvic floor program. So what we like people to do is develop enough skill so they can maintain a 10 second contraction at 80% of maximum, 10 second rest, three sets of 10 in a row in standing, taking a 30 second rest between sets. Now that's not enough. Often people come to me and they say, Marcy, I'm doing my exercises, I'm doing my exercises, and I'm still leaking. The exercises help you with your skill. They might also help you get the muscles stronger. But remember, the in automatic system isn't working. This is an intentional contraction. You have to know how to use it. You have to know when to use it. And you have to remember to use it. So you need to use it when you need it. So if you leak when you cough or sneeze or stand up, even if you don't leak all the time, you have to remember to use it at that time. You have to tighten it before the activity, keep it tight during the activity and only relax the pelvic floor when the activity is over. So again, skill is the first and foremost, most important component. If you don't contract correctly, the contraction will be not will not be helpful. If you don't contract correctly, you're not gonna make it stronger either, you're doing the wrong thing. You have to intentionally contract your pelvic floor with activities associated with leakage, even if you don't leak every single time. So you have to remember and tell your muscle to contract at the appropriate times, otherwise the exercises won't be that helpful. So you have to contract before the activity, you have to hold it during whichever activities cause you to leak, and then you let it go once the activity is over. One of the questions I frequently get is, Marcy, am I going to get dry? Am I, am I going to get dry? And it's really hard to give people a percentage. Yes, this percentage of people do get dry in the end because there's such variation in the literature. You can't look at one study. You have to put all the studies together. There's just too much variation. Some of the studies define incontinence as using only one pad. Some define, uh, sorry, define continence as only using one pad. Some studies define um, continence as being completely, completely dry. So there's 
There's variation, there's variation on the ages of people, the grade of cancer, the surgical approach, the type of um, how extensive the removal was, how long the person is from surgery. So I, I know if I was on the other end of the conversation, I'd want that stat, but I can't give it to you because there's just too much variation in the literature. One of the other things that happens is, so one of the things that happens is that there's just some natural healing that happens. So people find that even, a lot of, if the incontinence is, if, if continence is going to return, a lot of that happens within the first year, but there are definitely people who find improvement up to two or three years after their surgery. So, you, you know, you go in, there's the bladder, there's the prostate, it's removed, um, and the muscle and possibly nerve fibers are disturbed. Now, when we talk about nerve sparing, we're not talking about nerve sparing for bladder function. We're talking about nerve sparing in terms of erectile function. But, so there is some nerve that gets disturbed and some muscle fiber gets removed. Whatever's been cut or removed is not going to grow back. But you're going to have muscle and nerve tissue in that area that's unhappy. It's had surgery near it. It's had some bleeding. It's lost some blood supply. The area is kind of swollen. The tissues aren't going to be working ideally. And so that's why as the tissues, whatever's remaining, starts to improve its function over time, there's a natural improvement that can happen. So we find that the, nerve, the muscle fibers, you know, within the first six to eight months start working and the nerve fibers within six months to a couple of years, if whatever is remaining function is going to come back. So that's one of the reasons why it takes, it can be up to two or three years before the person finds their um, sort of their plateau where they're going to get to on their own. But there's also the benefit of using your pelvic floor. So often the people I see in this program are within the first year after they've had their surgery. But I do get people in the program, they're two years, three years, five years, 10 years after surgery, any of that natural recovery is going to happen, has already happened. And people get definite benefit and definite improvement by you learning how to use their pelvic floor, improving skill and using it at the appropriate times. So really it's a combination of changes that happen in the body over time, as well as learning how to use your pelvic floor as a tool to intentionally use to stop pelvic, to stop urinary incontinence. Okay, so I'm gonna move on to the next part of the lecture. At the beginning, I said, you know, myself and your healthcare team, we're going to do every possible thing we can to help you be as dry, as dry, as dry can be. But in case that doesn't happen or until it does, we would like to support you in figuring out how to be involved in every single thing that you want to be involved in with full confidence in your bowel or bladder management strategies. So there's a whole bunch of different things here. And we're going to be talking about these. One of the things that can be helpful, people often don't realize this, if you have an extended health benefits plan, you might want to check with your extended health, uh, the benefits, to see if they cover continence products. And if they do, what documentation do you need? Is it just receipts? Do you need a physician referral um, or a requisition? So check into that. Um, if you don't have extended health benefits, you might be able to use it as a tax write-off. So check with your accountant. It depends on your income, um, how much you earn, how much you spend, so um, and your overall um, health uh, costs for that year. So talk with an accountant. So one of the things that we recommend is using pads or briefs. We recommend that you use male products um, and that you use continence products. So continence products are meant to wick away moisture, liquid. Menstrual products are meant to, to absorb and manage blood. Also, male products are narrower at the bottom. So if you're looking at the pad, they're narrower at the bottom and wider at the top because, excuse me, men kind of leak in a different area of the body and guys kind of hang off to one side. So if this pad is the same width all the way up and you're hanging off to one side, you might find that you leak off to the side of the pad. So we recommend using male products. And the same thing with if you're using an adult brief, um, men leak in a slightly different area, different area than uh, female anatomy. So the incontinence, this is the front of the pad and the extra padding goes right up to the top because again, um, people um, with a, a penis tend to leak more in the front than if your urethra is at the bottom. Now, if you're using a brief and you're going out and say you need to change it, 
you're in public, you're using the public washroom in the restaurant or the theater, you've got to go into the restaurant, if in, into the toilet. If you're not in a washroom for people with disabilities, you're in a stall. You've got to go into that stall in that narrow space, take your shoes off, take your pants off, take this thing off, find somewhere to put it. There aren't garbage cans in individual stalls in the male, male washrooms. Um, and then you've got to find your clean one, put it on, put your pants back on, put your shoes back on, and then figure out where to use the one that, that get rid of the one that you've just been taken off. So that can be a lot. It can be time consuming and difficult in a small area. So what we recommend is if you're using a brief that's form fitting, that's tight, you can actually put a pad in the front inside that brief. So all you have to do is change the pad, right? You see, so this just goes inside the brief. It's inside. And when you're wanting to change, you just go into the stall and that's all you have to manage. Now, if you're putting this inside the brief, there's an adhesive strip on the back that goes on the underwear. Don't use that, don't take off the, the strip so that you do not want the adhesive uh, material sticking to the inside of the brief because when you take this off it'll pull the brief apart. Briefs should be fitting snugly and tightly and this will actually just stay inside the brief. So that might be a tip. Some people actually find that it's less expensive also just changing the brief. Um, these are some uh, links where you can get some free samples. You can also google uh, free samples in the different uh, makes and see if you can find some other options online. Sometimes it can be helpful to try different styles. Different brands fit differently. There are also external devices that are worn on the shaft of the penis. Um, I have one here. Um, so this is one of them. It's called a Yuri Quack. And it's just a device that goes on the shaft of the penis and it compresses the urethra. Some of the devices have an extra this is flatter, this has an extra lip on it. If there's an extra lip on the clamp, that goes on the underside where the urethra is. So we're gonna look at some of these. Um, one of the things is the person has to be cognitively aware. Um, you can't just put this on and forget about it. You have to be able to feel it. You have to be able to follow a clock and change it um, regularly or release it so that there's blood flow into the penis. You have to have good genital sensation. If it's on too tight, you won't feel discomfort and you could have some tissue damage. If the skin is wearing down or irritated, so more irritated because of um, urinary incontinence that's been sitting in urine and some people's skin gets, red, skin gets red and irritated, you cannot use a clamp on skin that's broken down. Uh, talk to your physician and find out some uh, products and techniques. Maybe one of them would be changing your pad or your brief more often. Um, take care of that skin and then if you want to use a clamp, you can. You have to be aware of bladder filling. You have to know when that signal to empty is going to happen. You have to be able to manage the clamp. Um, we do recommend that people use it judiciously, especially in that first year. If you're using it all the time, you're not going to be aware of the natural changes and the improved continence. You're not going to have a chance to use your pelvic floor to learn how to manage your own bladder control without the clamp. When this is on, it does restrict blood flow. So we don't want people wearing it for long periods of time. Wear it as per the product instructions. If there's no product instruction, make sure that you take it off at least every two hours for a good few minutes. Let the blood flow come back. Never wear this when you're sleeping during the day or at night when you're sleeping. You'll fall asleep. You'll be wearing it for too long. Um, if you have any kind of penile prosthesis implanted, do not wear it. You'll ruin the prosthesis and the surgery. And again, there are some physicians that prefer their patients do not use a clamp within the first year um, because they're not going to be aware of changes. And they're not going to have the opportunity or have the, the same drive to use their pelvic floor um, if they're using this a lot during the first year. So these are some of the clamps. We find that these are really, really, uh, people find these ones some of the most success with these. They're available on the internet. These are some other clamps that are available. Um, this one's available in the pharmacy. Some people are a bit concerned because there's these metal prongs sticking up from it, but these are all different options that are available to people. There is research that show that it improves quality of life. There is another product 
um, that's been on the market for a couple of years. And this is an internal device. So this is the device, it's paired with this. This is called the inserter. So this is the inserter with the Contino in it. This gets inserted into the urethra. You separate this from the inserter, you move out, you pull out the inserter and the Contino is left within the urethra and it basically works like a plug and stops urine from coming through, coming out. When the person wants to void, the Contino is removed. After voiding, it's put back in. This has to be fit by a healthcare professional. Um, I'm not sure if it's, I think it's being fit for people in Ontario and it's also being fit for in a few places um, in British Columbia. So this is also available to you. So again, some physicians prefer that people don't use clamps or Contino's within that first year. Many physicians are fine with it. Um, there is further research needed to identify possible side effects. Uh, we know that if the clamp is on, it does restrict blood flow and it can take up to 40 minutes for that blood flow to return. Um, if you're involved in penile rehab, it might be another reason that you don't want to be using a clamp a lot because it does restrict blood flow um, and you want ongoing improved, consistent, constant improved blood flow to help um, improve erectile function down the road. And again, you because it does restrict blood flow, you just want to be uh, make sure that you you're taking it off as per the product uh, requirements, just allowing some blood flow in. Another thing, if you are taking off the clamp, make sure that the opening of the urethra is directed over the toilet bowl. When you undo that clamp, there's going to be urine backed up. And even if you're Olympic and your skill and strength through your pelvic floor, you won't be able to stop the urine flow. And so just make sure that it's not going to get on you or all over whatever, that you're, 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 the opening of the tip of the penis is directed right at the toilet, at the water in the toilet bowl. Because the minute you release, urine's going to come out. This is another uh, collection device. And this is a condom catheter and leg bag drainage. So it's a condom that's manufactured not for sexual purposes. It's got this little tube on it. And this is meant, it's got an adhesive. It goes on the end of the penis. It's rolled up, uh, opened up over the penis. It, it adheres onto the penis. And then you attach a tube at the base here and it goes into a bag. And this bag can either go on the thigh or lower down on the leg. It's strapped on. When it gets full, there's a little valve here. You undo the strap, open it, move this over the toilet bowl, open the valve, drain it, close the valve, put it back on your leg. There's many, many people in life that are using this for a variety of different conditions. Um, there's geographic practice patterns. Locally, we don't see this used that often unless a person has really a very, very large amount of urinary incontinence during the day and or night. Um, but there are some people who prefer to use this than a clamp, and they prefer to use this to pads or uh, briefs. There's, there's no right or wrong. There's just different practice patterns, different preferences. We just want people to be aware of all of the different options. This is an anal plug. This goes in the anus, this stays out. So it goes right in the sphincter. The body lubrication, um, it'll, as it gets wet, it'll start to expand. And it's just a plug for people that are having some urine, uh, some fecal leakage or incontinence. So this is an option for people as well as pads or adult briefs that are having fecal or bowel control problems. So this is some research that is over the last couple of years that shows that pelvic floor exercises are helpful for the urinary incontinence component. Um, there's another page with some other, um, some of this is showing, so we use biofeedback in the clinic. Um, you have, we don't use the internal probes. There's lots of reasons why we don't use those. We find that surface little electrodes on either side of the anus, all you feel is a little sticky going off. And then when you're finished uh, going on and when you're finished, it comes off. And the biofeedback reads the electrical output of the pelvic floor muscles, just like a heart monitor reads the heart and graphs it. Instead of reading heart muscle, this um, equipment reads the pelvic floor activity. So when the person contracts, it goes up. When they're maintaining the contraction, it stays there. When they relax, it goes down. And there's also games that people can play that help people understand how to control that muscle. Um, it's an amazing tool. I would not work without it. It's not for everyone. It's not always needed. It is not diagnostic. It's simply a tool to help the person learn how to use their muscle. It can also help the physiotherapist to understand what's going on, um, especially if the person's standing with a sheet around them. I can't really see their pelvic floor, but biofeedback gives me some information. It doesn't substitute my need to assess what's going on. Sometimes biofeedback is not perfect. Um, 
Anyways, there's different ways of using it, but there is also research showing that biofeedback can be helpful. So we're leaving bowel and bladder function, and we're going to now talk about um, sexual incontinence and how pelvic floor exercises can be a component of uh, bladder control with sexual activity. So we like to define the word sexual incontinence as meaning urinary incontinence with sexual activity. Back in Incontinence can happen, the person has a sexy thought or looks at someone or something and just has sexual thoughts. It can happen with actual sexual arousal. It can happen with sexual activity. It can also happen at the time of orgasm. If it happens at the time of orgasm, we call that climacteria. So we like people to know that urine um, on or in someone's body is not harmful. So we've been socialized since we've been little to think that urine is ucky, but actually it is actually is harmless on or in a body. Many people, once they know that, or even before, it's not a problem. Sex is kind of wet and sticky anyways. This is just maybe a new or a bit of a different wet and sticky. Some people, if they void, they go pee before they're sexually active, it, it eliminates or significantly decreases urine leakage. Some people have less, I'm worried about the bed, let's just put a towel underneath and then they don't have to worry about the sheets or the linens or the furniture. And then maybe just go for dessert, have a shower together afterwards. Pelvic floor exercises, we're gonna look at that research. There is some research to show that if you uh, strengthen and bulk up your pelvic floor, um, it can help with some of the sexual incontinence. Some people I say, well, if you're worried about leaking, you know how to use your pelvic floor. So just have a gentle contraction in the background. And then the people come back to me and they say, you know what, Marcy? Well, actually a few people come back and they say, Marcy, wow, that was wonderful. That's all I need. It just really frees myself up or myself, and my partner. It's wonderful. I can just have it on in the background. It works. But the majority of people come back and they go, you're nuts. I can't think of tightening my pelvic floor and being intimate and sexual at the same time. I kind of lose focus on what I'm doing and it kills the experience for me. But it's another option for people to try. If you have an erection, you can keep a condom on. You can use a constrictor band at the base of the penis. And if you have a condom, you can use a constrictor band over the condom. So that might help keep the urine in a little bit. There are some people who are happy when they leak urine with the sexual activity. It reminds them of ejaculate. You know, it doesn't matter what we need to work with whoever is there, whoever is having the concern and figure out what works for that person. But whoever you are, if you're having any sexual dysfunction related to prostate cancer in the treatment, you're having erectile dysfunction, you're leaking urine with sexual activity and it's bothering you, definitely come see physio for the urine component, but also attend the sexual health module. And again, all of these services are available throughout the province in office or online. Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about erectile dysfunction, but before we talk about that, I want to make sure that we all have the same vocabulary and understanding. So I'm going to talk about four words, arousal, orgasm, erection, and ejaculation. Now, if you've had your prostate removed, you're not going to have ejaculation. That won't be happening anymore. If you've had your prostate removed, most likely very soon after surgery and ongoing for a while or for you've lost the ability to have erectile function, but you're going to have some erectile dysfunction at the beginning or at some point. So you've had your prostate removed, you might not have an erection. But even though you don't have ejaculate and you're not having an erection, you can still have arousal and orgasm through self or partner stimulation with absolutely no erectile function. So we like people to know about this. Often I'll say this to people and people kind of go, yeah, Marcy, I kind of figured that out. And some people are just like, really? They had no idea. So we like people to know about this. Now, what happens with your pelvic floor? Remember, you can't separate the inside and the outside layers. These are the outside layers. So the cavernous nerves, so when we talk about nerve sparing surgery, we're talking about the cavernous nerves. They travel along the outside um, of the prostate. So you travel around the outside of the prostate and then um, into the penis. There's a right and a left one. So they're the nerves that are responsible for managing or maintaining erectile function. There are different nerves for arousal and orgasm. 
So they try to spare the cavernous nerves and it'll either be bilateral sparing, so the right and the left are remaining or unilateral, so that either the right or the left or non-nerve sparing. And they'll always try to say that in surgery, but they might they won't know if it's been nerve sparing surgery until the surgery is over. And that's information you can get from your surgeon. If there is injury to these nerves, then people develop erectile dysfunction. What we find that if you bulk up the ischiocavernosis and bulbocavernosis muscles, it increases pressure within the penis and it prevents outflow. So we really, really, really wanna make those muscles bigger. So if I wanna make my biceps bigger, I do a load of exercise. I do an intensity, a number of um, reps with enough uh, exertion in a specific time period to make that muscle bigger. So we, at rest, the muscle is bigger. And then when you're aroused, that muscle actually automatically starts tightening so you even have bigger bulk. So we want a pelvic floor exercise program that brings about a strengthening, bulking hypertrophy um, improvement in the muscle. And there is uh, research to show that pelvic floor muscle training improves erectile dysfunction and actually um, decreases early ejaculation. There's a trial, uh, as a review of 10 trials, um, and they showed improvement by, with a pelvic floor muscle training program. Um, there is a study specific to prostatectomy, and they show that um, supervised, not just verbal and written instruction, supervised pelvic floor exercises started 12 months after prostatectomy. Um, three months of exercises actually helped improve erectile function and decreased urine leakage at the time of orgasm. That's the lecture. This is the contact information for the program. Feel free just to contact by phone. Um, by fax, you can email, you can go on our website um, for more information about the program. We really, really encourage people to um, make use of the program. It's fantastic. And we also provide, we are a resource for other health professionals. Um, so if you're a physiotherapist watching this and you have questions, I'm also happy to help you with any um, information around prostate uh, uh, cancer and, and treatment for incontinence and, and the the pelvic floor component for erectile function and sexual incontinence.